21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. You know, when I when I started this journey um, about five years ago, I mentioned that life just broke for me. I mean, the way that I did life just broke. It stopped working. And many reasons led up to that. And I, a part of it, uh, the biggest catalyst was the realization that I had missed a lot of my kids growing up. And so when I when I left a job that was highly, I mean, honestly, it was a job I thought that I would be in the rest of my career. I thought that's how where I would finish my career in. And so when I left it, I was I was on really shaky ground. I wanted to start this business. I wanted to do what I felt that I was called to do. Honestly, all the way back when I was a teenager, but I was scared, man. I was afraid. because of the unknown. And so I jumped into another role that I should not have done. And then at the end of that, um, I left that 11 months later. And at that point, I did start this business. And then I went to work for a good friend of mine. It was almost, it was basically like my first client, but I was on his payroll kind of a thing. I did. I, I helped him build in his executive team. And then um, after, and then Douala was there, that's when I started writing the book and I finished my, finished my project there. So I was done. And then I wrote the book, the book came out and, and that's where I hit another crisis. The book was released in October of this last year. And so six months ago. And the day the book came out, Martin, I cannot, ex I can't explain to you the emotion that was going through me. You know, a lot of people that were asking me, I mean, are you so excited? Today's the book release and blah, 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 blah. And if I didn't know the person, I, you know, I was, I was kind. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's exciting stuff. But to people that I knew well, I said, no, man, I'm not excited. Um, I, I, I'm in a real bad place right now. And I couldn't even explain it. And I went into this funk for a while. Now, one of the things when I started this business, and I, I'm going to go around the bar in just a second. I'll come back. Um, when I started this business, I had a, uh, I had a real good friend, 83-year-old friend of mine. And uh, we served on a board together. And so we became friends with that. And he found out I was starting this business. And and he called me up and he said, hey, he, he, Joe, hey, Matthew, let's go out for a beer. And so we uh, so the two of us met for a beer and we're talking and he said, don't do this alone. And I said, OK, um, I, I can't afford to hire anybody at this point. I'm a startup man. So what do you recommend? And and he said, put together a personal board of directors, you know, personal board of advisors. And so I did that. And he was one of them. He is one of them. And so there's there's four of us, five plus me, um, that uh, we meet quarterly, and we meet for half a day. And I tell you what, having those four people, and one of them is my wife, which um, actually kind of surprised the guys, but uh, but it, it's great. I love having her there. She's a part of this process, so she gets to see the inner workings. But we met in November after the book came out and I went into that meeting and I just said, um, and it, we just, I gave my perfunctory report and then they said, well, how are you doing? And I just said, guys, I said, you know, it was a nice try, but I'm done. I'm, I'm gonna go get a job. I'm just gonna, it's not worth it. I just, I, I can't do this. And literally to a person, they all said, whoa, 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 stop this. Let's stop the train for a second. Let's go back. And so they all made me go back to basically three years ago or three years prior. And they said, okay, this is where we started. And this is what's happened. And then this happened. And then this happened. And this happened. Here's where we are. Now let's look ahead. We have this opportunity in front of us. We have this one. We have this one. We have this one. We have this one. It's like, you're not quitting now. There's no way you're quitting now. It's like, you're going to continue to go. And Martin, if I wouldn't have had those people in the room that day, if it had just been me, I'd probably be, I probably would have given up and I would have gone and gotten a job by now.
And and so because I was I just I can't explain to you the emotion. Literally, the book came out, and my first my thought that day when I woke up that morning was not oh wow the book's coming out today. It was oh shit now what? I don't know what to do now. You know I was so focused on writing this book that um, I felt like I I felt like I didn't have any purpose because I I had not I had forgotten the bigger picture. Right? I was so focused on one thing that I forgot the bigger picture. When I think about work-life balance, um, I think about it in terms of seasons. And so right now I'm in a season of a lot of activity and a lot of work. The one thing that is that is a, a difference in doing it the way that I'm doing it now on my own versus when I worked in corporate is that now um, I work on when I want to work and I work on my terms. And so now that, and that's not always the case. You know how that is. You have to you have to you have to make hay while the while there's daylight, right? The old old saying that farmers used. Um, and uh, but for the most part, I I block out times for my family. I make sure that I'm at my kids' events. Um, I make sure that I, when they're home, that I'm, I'm present and I'm around. And that was not always the case for me. I mean, especially the last, the last 12, 12 years, I guess, especially it probably went back a little further than that. Uh, probably the last 15 years. Um, I was, I traveled a lot. I was gone a lot. I missed a lot. And, and I didn't realize, quite frankly, how much I had missed until my oldest son graduated from high school. And we were getting ready for his big open house party. And we were digging through all these photos. We had, my wife had boxes and boxes of photos we were digging through. And literally, I, I was like, wait a minute, where was I? When did that happen? What, what was that? And, and, and I, I began to have this dawning realization. This was five years ago. I had this realization that I missed a lot. I miss too much. And and what that led to in my life, Martin, was this uh, this collision. And it, it seemed like all of a sudden, the way that I did things stopped working. And it's like, okay, I, I need to make a change here. I need to change the way that I'm living life. You know, I have three kids. I still had two at home. And, and I was missing them too. And so I literally just jumped, I, I quit. And, and I went to, I went into, at that time I was going to start my own business. Um, but I was, I was afraid. Kids are expensive, man. And I, I wanted that paycheck and I wanted the benefits. And so I went to another job ill-advisedly. I should not have done it. I had people tell me, don't do that, but I did it. And, um, and I hated it. And I lasted 11 months there. Um, you know, I don't, I don't fail much in my life. I have failed. And, and that was a, that was a failure. But I needed to go through that because through that experience, then it began to awaken in me this really this desire of, okay, you know, since I was a teenager, I wanted to do what I'm doing right now, but I never had the courage to do it. And so it was after that experience that I started this business, I started to write, and now I'm doing it. And, uh, you know, I'm not yet, I'm not even at break even yet, but, um, and I, I, but I've said this to many people that I'm, I'm not making, I'm making less money that I've ever made in my career, but I'm, I am satisfied. I am, uh, I'm experiencing more joy and I'm experiencing more purpose in my work than I, than anything I've ever done. And satisfaction, joy, purpose, that's 
absolutely amazing context for having success. It is. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we get caught up a lot with success being all about money, right? You're not successful until you're making a certain level of income. You're not successful until you have, until you're, you know, in, in my world with, with writing books, part of my world, anyway, writing books, you're not successful unless you're a best-selling author or you've sold, you know, millions of copies of books. You're not, you're not successful unless you have a certain amount of access or, you know, maybe in your world until you have a certain amount of downloads. And, um, and I just, I'm, I, I'm fighting against that definition of success because that is an empty definition of success. You know, I have been in places, I've been in parts of my career where I've made very good money. I've had access to um, very powerful people, very wealthy people. And, and I, and in the moment you think, wow, this is great. This is amazing. But at the end of the day, it was empty, man. I was empty inside. I was struggling and, and I couldn't get my head around that until honestly, it's, it's been this last five year journey that I've been on of really looking for, okay, what is my purpose? What is my why in life? Why am I here? And in, in exploring that and beginning to live that, I'm beginning to find that inner, um, inner, inner peace and joy and purpose in what I do, because I feel like I'm doing what I was called to do, what I was made to do, and really live out my why in this world. And now you have contact with that kind of energy that you actually need to success on all levels, on all aspects of life. And I suppose your experience in, is one of the reasons why you have a specific 3E model, empathy, empowerment, and excellence. If you can share a little bit more about that one. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, that's the foundation. Uh, I call those the pillars of building a flourishing organization. That is the focus of my second book, which comes out later this year. And in in thinking about, um, I wrote this, I wrote the first book out of years of experience and working with leaders all over the world. Um, I've been to over 40 countries, I've trained and I've developed leaders and teams in in, in four, over 40 countries. And as, as, as I was talking with these leaders, a story, um, a story was told to me, not just once, twice, three times, Martin, I heard it a hundred times. And it was these successful entrepreneurs more most of the time that had built a they built a successful business, and they'd sit across the table from me, or we'd sit across you know in a chair from each other, and they would begin to share with me, um, oftentimes with deep emotion, about you know I have sacrificed my I sacrificed so much to build this business because I thought this would bring me satisfaction, I thought it would bring me joy and purpose in life. Now here I am. I have a great business. I'm making a lot of money. I have, you know, time. I have flexibility. I have autonomy or whatever I want. And I, I, I'm unsatisfied. I'm miserable inside because I've sacrificed. Usually they met, they sacrifice their marriage. Oftentimes they're in a second or third marriage or they weren't married. Or if they were married, they were living almost separate lives. Um, or they are dead. Exactly. Yes, they're dead. The topic that people not speak so much about, but there are some authors I, I had interviews with, like a Neverland book. They made an, a research and there are a lot of people that cannot cope with it anymore. You're right. Even that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And their kids, you know, they're basically their kids want nothing to do with them because they weren't around. And And so as I was having these conversations over and over and over again, it was, it made me look in the mirror because I was doing the same thing to my family and, and my wife and I were growing apart. My kids, you know, they were living their own lives. I was not a part of it. And that's what made me finally say, you know, enough, I just chasing dollars. There's no purpose in that. There is no satisfaction in that whatsoever. And so, so I wrote this first book based on, um, based on th that story. And talking about, you know, what does it mean to live a flourishing life? And it's all about living an intentional life at the intersection of, you know, what are you really good at doing? How do you contribute value? What is your calling? And and what is your passion? And so what living at the intersection of that and really living that out, you know, regardless of money, it's just living that out. And then the second book that I just finished, it's actually, um, I actually just released it to my editor. Um, that the three pillars are empowerment, I'm sorry, empathy, empowerment, and excellence. You know, empathy is all about 
understanding and knowing people, treating people as people. And I think we've lost a lot of that in the world right now, especially coming out of COVID. I think with people being isolated for as long as they were, um, I think it, it's it, it created this um, almost like this false boundary, this these false walls. And in in people now, I think are trying to figure out okay, how do I come out of that, and how do I reengage relationally? And I think it's just this awkward time we're in. And um, and I think organizations, quite frankly, ha- can make that worse when they don't treat people like people. They treat them like you know a line item on their balance sheet or their or their um, their expense on their spend on their income statement on their expense side. And so you know what happens when people have a downturn or a company has a downturn? First thing they do is they lay off people. Well, is that the is that the thing you should be doing if people are your most important asset? You know, I think there's other ways. So that's empathy, just knowing people, understanding people. Empowerment is all about leadership development. It's all about how do you how do you how do you empower the next generation of leader, especially how you develop them, how do you delegate authority, how do you delegate with responsibility and accountability? That's the key. And so we t- I talk about that in the book. And then the final one is excellence. How do you build a culture where everything that we're committed to and everything we do is, is with this unwavering commitment, unyielding commitment to excellence? And from your experience, a big one, how many organizations need that kind of change, especially after COVID? I think... I think every organization, <laughs> every, every, yes. yeah, I, th- I think they all need at least a tune up. All, all <laughs> so, of them. <laughs> yeah. Right. When you felt more alive now or before in your, in your past life. And when did you love more yourself and your family now or in your past life? Oh my, it's now. Now I, I feel more alive now, and like I said earlier, I'm not even yet even breaking even in my business, but I feel more alive, and I feel more at peace with myself and in just what I'm doing now. And you know what? It's someday, uh, someday the income will be there, um, and if it's not, that's fine. You know, I, I can I'm employable. I can get a job someday, but I'm, I'm hoping I don't have to do that. I'm hoping that I can build this thing. And, and be able to continue to pursue and, and build into people's lives. And, you know, for so long, Martin, I was focused on me, right? I was focused on, okay, I got to climb the corporate ladder. I got to make more money. I got to have more authority and more power, blah, blah, blah. And I was miserable doing it. Absolutely miserable doing it. And now I'm focused on giving back. I'm focused on investing into and focus on, you know, coaching others, helping people become the better version of themselves, the best organizations possible to work for. And I, I, I'm loving it because it's not about me anymore. It's about other people. And I missed that for so many years, even my own family. I missed that. And I, you know, it's, I don't have a lot of regrets in life, but the ones I do have, man, they're big because, you know, I missed my family and that's, that's the, I can't get that back. How would you define being alive? How do you experience it? How do you perceive it? Uh, that is a great question, Martin. Um, I actually did a uh, I did a, a blog post on this, or released it on LinkedIn, um, probably about a month or so ago, and it was about being fully alive. What does it mean to be fully alive? And I've gotten that question quite a bit, actually, from people. You know, what does it mean to be fully alive? I referenced it in both my books, and even though the second book's not out yet, but Um, you know, what does it mean to be fully alive? And I, I, from my perspective, being fully alive is living aligned to how, to your why, you know, why are you here? Really taking time to go inward and say, you know, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? You know, what, why am I on this earth at this time in history? You know, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? And really understanding, and, and that requires a lot of introspection, looking inward and saying, okay, what am I really good at doing? What am I passionate about doing? What am I, um, how do I contribute value to others? What do other people tell me that I'm good at doing and how, and contribute value to them or to others? And then finally, what am I called to do? Now, calling is a very, um, it, it can be a very difficult thing to understand, to grasp, because it's, it's, it's almost like this ethereal concept of 
of okay well ho- calling seems a little you know mystical ho- hocus pocus kind of ho- kind of stuff and I, and I don't believe it is I think it's the it's that it's that inner sense of I was created to do that you know I'm here to do that it's something that uh, the way I describe calling is is that it's a, that one thing that never that's always in your mind of man I I feel like I should be doing that I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do and when you do it you feel this inner sense of satisfaction and joy like nothing else. And, and it's getting in touch with that and, and, and l- begin to live into that. You know, I, I've, I've, I've heard it said, I can't remember the original um, author of the quote, but if you find, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. That's what that calling is all about. It's understanding what you truly love to do. Um, but I think that doing many, many times, and I had this, I had this completely backwards for years. I would do, 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 you know, I'm an activities guy, right? I'm, I love to execute. I love to get things done. And I thought that that was my, that I thought that was my source of joy and what I was supposed to do in life. And I had it backwards because I was doing without fully understanding who I was. And so I had to go backwards and I had to really look inward and say, okay, who am I? Who am I? And who am I becoming? And where do I belong? And then out of those three, being Becoming, belonging, figuring out, okay, what is it I'm supposed to do out of that? Instead, I was doing it backwards for so long, doing and then trying to figure out who I am. It doesn't work that way. My client base is primarily um, family businesses and ranging in size from, you know, just, just under a million to, you know, a little over a hundred million. And, um, and so, and I love working with family businesses. I grew up in one, I ran ours for, you know, several years. I took the helm, had to restart it and then uh, took it and ran it for 12 years. And, and so I just, I love family business. I understand it. And it's just something that is my, I don't know, I'm just passionate about it. Let me tell you about one story in particular. So second generation company, and uh, the company was was bumping along at about the same pace, same size for many, many years. This guy took over, coming out of COVID, actually it was during COVID, um, it began to scale significantly and quickly. And before he knew it, in the course of about three years, it had grown by 4X in three years. And this is a company that had been around for a long time that was bumping along at the same pace. This guy took over and the only person he had ever, he only worked there and he worked for his dad. And so he basically led like his dad led. And, you know, I, I won't tell you all the words that uh, that have been used about his dad. His dad, um, you know, rest in, rest in peace, has passed away. Um, but his dad was was uh, very, uh, had a very uh, command and control type of approach. And so this guy thought that that's what you should do. And so that's what he did. Well, as it worked, as long as it stayed the same size. Now, all of a sudden, they're 4X and he's trying the same approach and it's not working. Their turnover is through the roof. They can't figure out how to get leaders on board. You know, they would hire what they thought was a great leader. And then they would they would either flame out or they'd quit. And they couldn't figure out what was going on, what's going on. Finally, this guy looked in the mirror and he said, the problem's me. So this guy has a has really had a crash course in emotional intelligence. And he started with self-awareness. And so at that point, he said, I got to get help. I, I have to change. If I don't change, I'm going to I'm going to blow up this business. Um, you know, not literally, but I mean, it's going to it's going gonna, it's gonna, to it's going to right back down to where it was. And so he reached out and he's like, I need help. And he's like, I think that what you offer can help me. And so we started meeting and talking about what I'm talking about right now, empathy, empowerment and excellence. And I, but I told him, I said, it's got to start with you, bud. If you don't show empathy and, you know, literally my first conversation with him on empathy was like, oh, come on, man, I don't want to talk about empathy, blah, blah, blah. And so I just said, okay, are you going to trust me or not? And I said, just try it, just try it. And so we started with, uh, we started with story. And so I had his team come around him and we met and they all told their stories. They shared their stories and he shared his. And it, it, in the middle of sharing his story, he broke down and he's got tears coming out of his face. I didn't expect this at all. And, and from that day forward, his team treated him differently and he treated them differently. And now all of a sudden you went from this command and control guy to a guy that sh- expressed 
a little bit, just a little bit of vulnerability and authenticity and transparency and the rest of the guys respect for him and commitment to him, loyalty, loyalty to him shot through the roof. And so then we started working on things like, how do we really know each other? So we did some assessment work and, and then we began, then we pulled in the next layer of leadership and we did some emerging leader type training. And, and today, you know, I'm not going to say this is a, you know, it's not perfect, right? They still, you know, they're, they're human and, and they're, and they're still, they deal with day-to-day stress and struggles, but that company today looks fundamentally different than when we started. And, and I'm so proud of this guy, but it started with him and it has to start with the leader. It has to start with the lead leader. If the lead leader, the owner, the CEO, if they're not on board with, with changing and wanting to change their corporate culture, it won't work. And, and, you know, it, 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 you can have smaller changes and you can have minor changes inside the organization by working with other people, which I think any change is good. Um, but if you want to have a fundamental change, the organizational culture, the lead leader has to be on board. Um, just like this guy was. And so um, I love that story. And I, I love this guy to death. And I'd see some tremendous things happening in him and his company. And they continue to grow today. Um, but they 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 work together now differently. They went from what I would call a toxic culture to a healthy, high performing culture. Now it took time. It wasn't easy. But man, they're 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 on a really good path. It's all in our hands, this life of time Let's give unto us all I think, Barton, before we go, my final call to action, my final challenge to your listeners would be live intentionally. So many people that I've talked with, and again, the, the impetus or the motivation for writing the first book was in talking with these leaders and in really hearing them out of a heart of, of almost like a broken heart and a heart of regret of saying, man, if I could have done it differently or I wish I could have done it differently. With every field and rising sea, can hear the sounds of all. And, with every... and it was almost this sense of helplessness or like I I did something by accident I didn't do it intentionally it is all in our hands it is all in our hands and so I would want to implore your your listeners to to live life intentionally make intentional decisions look at the end of your life and say what is it that I want to be remembered for what is it that, you know, if I'm, if I'm 80, 90 years old, whatever, whatever you consider the end of life, um, and I'm sitting around a table with my closest colleagues, friends, family, and they're talking about me, and it's an, it's an honorarium to me. What, what is it that they're saying about me? And think about that and what you want to be remembered for then. And look at yourself now. I mean, are you living in such a way now that when you get to that point, that's what's going to be said about you? And I guarantee you, it's not going to be about how many zeros you have behind your net worth. It's not going to be how much power you have or how big your business has become. It's going to be all about relationships. It's going to be about legacy. It's going to be about impact. And so start living today intentionally so that by then you're living aligned to how you want to live at the end of your life. Twenty-first Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskorik.